The global economy fared better than expected in 2023, with inflation in most parts of the world declining. And yet prospects for 2024 remain deeply uncertain, according to pundits. So what is the outlook for Korea? What are the variables that look to challenge growth? And how much of a risk does China's woes pose the global economy? Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Issues and Insiders. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today we explore the economic prospects for Korea and the broader global community in the new year. With us, I have Professor Kim Se-won at Uwon Women's University live on the line. Professor Kim, it's great to have you on. Thanks for having me today. I also have Professor Greg Buchak at Stanford University joining us live as well. Professor Buchak, as always, it's a pleasure. Glad to be here. Professor Kim, let's begin with the overall outlook for the Korean economy this year. Well, uh, Korean economy for 2024 would be a year of slow recovery. Uh, in terms of economic growth, its expected growth rate is around 2.2% for uh, 2024, uh, which is higher than uh, 2023's 1.4%, but it is still uh, much lower than Korean economy's potential growth of uh, over 3%, uh, particularly the largest part of GDP. Uh, domestic consumption will be more stagnated uh, than last year with only 1.8% uh, expected growth for this year. The domestic consumption expected growth is uh, smaller than last year's 1.6% growth. Uh, domestic consumption actually is not much increasing because of large uh, household debt and long-lasting high interest rate. But rapid increase in export is expected for this year by cheap export recovery and continuous uh, export increases in, in automobile and, and, and ships. Uh, therefore, uh, the export uh, will be the largest momentum in Korean economy recovery for this year. Last year's inflation was 3.6% uh, on year, but Inflation pressure will be much lessened uh, this year with expected inflation of 2.6%. But I have to say that there are still uh, uncertainties related to inflation from uh, international oil price and the war in Ukraine. Right, indeed. And also against that backdrop then, Professor Buchak, what can you tell us about the prospects of the global economy, including that of the U.S. in the year 2024? Sure. So uh, the OECD is forecasting an average of 2.8% real GDP growth, along with rapidly declining inflation. And we've sort of seen that happening in the second half of 2023. That's not a booming rate of growth, but given what central banks have been doing to combat inflation, it's really not that bad. Um, the highest growth rates globally are going to be among developing economies like India and China. China's growth expectation is down to 5%, which is sort of high relative to other countries, but it's lower than it has been in China historically. I think we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, the U.S. And, and Korea, as Professor Kim mentioned, they're both seeing sort of steady, not super high growth, 1.5% in the U.S., a little over 2% in uh, Korea. Nothing spectacular, but it, I think it's actually pretty good given this sort of high, uh, that they're high income countries and the high interest rate environment, particularly in the US that was uh, there to combat inflation. Kind of bringing up the rear of the pack is, is Europe. So Germany, the UK, they're expected to have some positive, but kind of below 1% growth. Again, they're not terrible numbers, but they don't exactly inspire uh, confidence. Right. So I think it, you know it's, it's important to be, sorry, very, very humble when making these predictions. It's very likely that sort of unexpected things will happen. Um, hopefully it's a good surprise, but you never know. And I, I'll say sort of right now, the main things I'm watching out for are whether inflation in the U.S. is really addressed and also the political situation around the upcoming presidential election. Right, indeed. And Professor Kim, like you mentioned, oil prices as well as the armed conflict in Ukraine, they remain as variables to economic growth. That being said, what more can you tell us about the risk factors, especially the external ones, to Korea's uh, economic growth for this year? Uh, this year, we can say that there are two different challenges in the short run and long run. Uh, first, in the short run, as we talked about, weaker domestic consumption limits uh, Korean economic growth for this year. The household debt, uh, which amounts to 
uh, GDP of nation is rising again from last year as housing price increases. And the high interest rate makes households uh, to further decrease their spending on goods and services. In addition, we do not yet know uh, when market interest rate begins to fall this year. So continuing uncertainties on interest rate also uh, decreases domestic consumption further. And in the long run, it, became, uh, it becomes more difficult for Korean major industries like chips and secondary batteries to maintain their international competitiveness uh, thanks to the rise of China and competition with major countries like US, Taiwan, and Japan. It means that it is necessary for Korea to implement uh, industry reforms for gaining competitiveness in the in the fourth wave industrial revolution like artificial intelligence, bio, uh, secondary batteries, and so on. So for that purpose, uh, structural reforms in the labor market, immigration policy, and higher level education in colleges are also needed. But as we know, uh, the progress of these reforms are very slow uh, these days uh, due to serious conflicts of interest among workers, uh, companies, and governments. Right. Hopefully, we'll see a bit more progress this particular year then. Professor Buchak, you briefly touched upon this. Like in a speech this past Sunday, I believe, uh, to usher in the new year, even Chinese President Xi Jinping, he acknowledged the difficulties that China itself was facing, uh, economically, that is. What do you believe are some of the main challenges faced by China on the economic front? Sure. So, you know, China's GDP is expected to grow at 4 to 5 percent per year, which in absolute terms is actually pretty high. Um, but sort of what the, what the concern is, is, is that's a bit slow uh, given where they are in terms of income level. So to sort of take a step back, China until recently was a low income country. And there's kind of a standard recipe for development uh, for a low income country. You, you build housing, you build factories, you build infrastructure, you import technology and you, you educate your people. That's something that's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do when you have a strong central government. And China has done a really great job of that historically. And historically, their GDP growth has been north of 10%. So now they're looking at this 5 or 4% GDP growth and becoming a little concerned, uh, because while their incomes are higher, they're still pretty low compared to other countries. So to, to benchmark it a little bit, US GDP per capita is about $70,000. Japan and Korea are around thirty-five dollars to $40,000. Uh, but China is still only about $13,000 per capita. So that's pretty low. The question then is sort of what comes next, having exhausted all of these kind of easy growth opportunities like building houses, building factories, building infrastructure, which by many, which by sort of many measures are now sort of a little bit overbuilt and underutilized. So the, the main thing that I think they need to do is kind of reorient the economy to run on less investment and sort of more on consumer spending, which Professor Kim was mentioning in the, in the Korean context. That transition is actually pretty difficult to do. I think some of that is a little bit of an institutional and cultural bias uh, away from sort of consumption. You know, new high-speed rail looks really good. It feels like it's a prudent thing to do, but they've already built all the kind of important rail lines that should be built, and additional investment there might not have a huge marginal return. So they're going to have to undertake this reorientation kind of in the face of some near-term headwinds. Uh, there's a big suffering real estate sector. There's a little bit of a weak labor market, especially for, for young people. Sort of halfway through the year, the government stopped reporting uh, the youth unemployment rate. Um, there's growing debt also, both private in terms of household debt and corporate debt and also public debt. And I think sort of the urge that policymakers will have will be to relieve some of these short-term issues by falling back kind of on the old playbook of uh, you know, real estate investment, building more infrastructure, building more factories. But that's kind of not what the economy needs in the long term. And I think there's going to be some real tension there. And, and all that being said, then, Professor Buchak, how much of a risk does China's economic woes themselves pose uh, for the global economy? Sure. So I, I think the answer to that kind of depends on, on whether you're a big importer or a big exporter from China. So, you know, China's problem is really a consumer consumption problem. They need to boost consumer spending, but it seems like the Chinese government's instincts are sort of to boost investment instead. 
And if that's what they end up doing, if you're a country that imports a lot from China, that's great. You know, more factories will be making more things for less cost. This is good for importers. It's bad for foreign companies that compete. But, you know, if you're importing this stuff, it's good. On the other hand, if you're a big exporter to China, uh, a weak consumer can be a real drag on local business for, and your economy. So, for example, a lot of these European luxury brands, their growth relied on, ch on Chinese consumers. And since China's weaknesses sort of started showing up in the middle of last year, their sales have really struggled. Right. And stay and talk about exports to China. Professor Kim, findings for December show Korea's exports to the U.S. exceeded those to China for the first time in 20, in two decades, that is, 20 years. Could this be a lasting trend, do you think, Professor Kim? Uh, since China joins, uh, joined WTO in 2001, uh, China has been Korea's number one trading partner for the last two decades. But this is also true for many Asian countries like Japan, all Asian member ASEAN member countries and Taiwan. Uh, but for the first time in 20 years, as you talked about, Sunny, uh, the U.S. has overtaken China as South, South Korea's largest export market on a monthly basis in December uh, 2023. The numbers clearly illustrate this uh, reverse uh, situation in Korean export. Uh, export to U.S. surged 5.4% uh, on year in 2023, but export to China uh, dropped almost 20% on year in the same year. The reverse of uh, Korean export uh, between uh, U.S. and China is related to a booming U.S. economy, the expansion of domestic companies in the U.S. market, and a uh, and a, a strained international division of labor between China and U.S. as supply chains undergo reorganization. But but as you talked about, the big question here is whether the reverse continues for this year or not. Uh, it is uh, actually too early to answer this question because we have uh, 12 months to go for this year. But I would, cautious, uh, I would uh, cautiously say that there is a high possibility that uh, Chinese economy will gain the number one trading partner to Korea uh, this year. As uh, China's domestic consumption at big tech companies' investment recover sometime this year, they will begin to import uh, huge high-tech products like chips, panel screens, and other high-tech intermediary uh, goods from China. But in the long run, we have totally different situation because uh, Korean companies uh, are moving their production facilities from China to other countries like uh, Vietnam and India for avoiding uh, geopolitical uh, risks uh, related to China. Right. Professor Buchak, global oil prices, they also remain a key variable to economic stability, especially for countries like uh, Korea. Now, that being said, what are your prospects with regard to these prices, keeping in mind, of course, the armed conflict between Israel and Hamas and the general violence over in the Middle East, keeping in mind the twin bomb blasts on Wednesday afternoon in Iran as well. Yes, yeah, so there's definitely some risk there. Uh, rising oil prices can lead to inflation. They can reduce economic growth. And what's kind of tricky about a supply side disruption like this is that the monetary authority, the Fed, they can't just raise interest rates and make it go away. There's kind of a real production bottleneck that needs to be addressed. Um, at least in the case of the US, the US has actually been a net energy exporter since 2019. So kind of worst case, this won't be like a situation that we had in the 1970s where there was sort of like quotas on gas, you had to line up to fill up your car. Um, that said, oil trades in a global market. So if supply gets cut in the Middle East, prices in the U.S. And, and globally will rise, even if the U.S. doesn't literally consume oil that comes from the, uh, the Middle East. So uh, as you mentioned, with regard to the current conflict, you know, unfortunately, it has been and continues to be very costly in terms of Palestinian and, and Israeli lives. But, you know, thanks to a lot of restraint by people on all sides, it hasn't really grown in scope yet. Um, there are hints of problems developing. You've probably heard about the Houthis in Yemen that are targeting shipping. Uh, there are the deadly bombing in Iran that you mentioned. You know, the, the hope is that these issues don't widen into a broader conflict, um, but it's very possible that they could. You know, so far, the scope has been limited. We haven't seen big moves in the price of oil. 
Uh, of course, this could all change at any time, but you know, hopefully the conflict won't spread and, and, and the ongoing loss of life will be minimized. Right, hopefully. And Professor Kim, do you believe the government here will continue to extend its uh, fuel tax cuts to ease the burden on drivers in the country? Uh, it, it really depends on international oil price level and inflation pressure for this year. Uh, first of all, uh, last month, uh, Korean government has decided to extend uh, fuel tax cuts by two months until uh, February of this year. This is due to uh, reflecting soaring oil, global oil price and, and to ease public burden. So such reduced tax rate on oil have been in effect for gas since January 2021 and for diesel uh, since July of 2021. Since fuel price has a larger impact on inflation, fuel, fuel tax cut is also important in controlling inflation uh, for Korean government. Last year's inflation was 3.6%, uh, which was much higher than previously expected. The main driving force uh, for higher inflation in the second half of last year was higher oil price. So as long as international oil price moves around uh, $80 per barrel, uh, Korean government would continue to ease tax burden on gas and diesel. Right. And back in the U.S., Professor Buchak, when do you expect U.S. monetary policymakers to perhaps begin uh, cutting down their interest rates? All right. So the, the, the rate of inflation has cooled. Um, an indicator, it's kind of the less popular version of the, the CPI called the PCE. Um, it showed price increases fell to about 25 2.6 percent year over year recently. That's getting pretty close to the Fed's 2 percent year over year target. So things are looking good in terms of the direction that inflation is heading. The market uh, had been expecting rate cuts to begin this March. Um, to be honest, I think there's a little bit of wishful thinking here. The kind of pattern that we've seen in this whole rate cutting cycle is, is has the market has sort of thought that rates would be lower or they thought that they would start um, they would stop raising them sooner. They thought that they would start lowering them sooner. They've sort of been consistently making that same error. The Fed themselves, they seem to be a little bit more hawkish. I think almost everyone in the FOMC committee, um, uh, you know, they, they see rates coming down by the end of 2024, although actually a couple of them think rates will stay at their current level all year. Um, today in uh, transcripts that were released of the December meeting, this is the so-called FOMC minutes, uh, from the latest uh, from the latest meeting, there was talk of rates um, staying higher for longer than was anticipated, and uh, that there is even possibility thrown out there that rate hikes could happen if economic conditions warrant. So, you know, I, I think sort of the main message out of the Fed right now is nothing is set in stone. The path of future interest rates really depends on the data that's going to continue to come out over the course of the year, um, and interest rate cuts are certainly not guaranteed in the beginning of 2024. Uh, the Fed probably is right to temper expectations here. Just looking at the fundamentals, economic growth is relatively strong in the U.S. The labor market is showing some minor signs of weakness, but sort of overall, the picture is still pretty good. And inflation is still, it's coming down, but it's still a little bit above the Fed's target. So, I, you know, I think they want to make sure inflation targets are reached with some level of stability before they start cutting. I think they'd rather kind of overshoot than undershoot when it comes to bringing down inflation. So. You know, I don't see them being in a big hurry to lower rates. I think later half of, of 2024 seems realistic, barring any big developments. And Professor Kim, when do you see the Bank of Korea uh, easing its uh, tight monetary grip? Well, uh, uh, that is a really tough question, Sonny. Uh, I think there are two options for Bank of Korea in the way of cutting your interest rate this year. The first is before Fed does, and the second is after seeing Fed does. Uh, actually, when Bank of Korea began to raise its uh, key rate in 2021, they did, they did it before the Federal Reserve did. But I think this time is different compared to uh, that of 2021's situation. Uh, Bank of Korea became more risk averse uh, since Korean economy is still suffering from low economic growth and high inflation. Uh, and, and Bank of Korea has a new chairman. Uh, it means that ba Bank of Korea is likely, more likely uh, to cut the rate after seeing uh, the Fed does. Uh, 
Uh, actually, since Professor Buchak expects uh, Federal interest rate, U.S. Fed's interest rate would cut its key rate in March, uh, I would say Bank of Korea uh, would cut its key rate after uh, March, uh, which means it, like in April and May. Uh, and general election is coming in April in South Korea, so there is there can be an unseen pressure to cut the rate from government. Uh, I think this could be another factor of deciding the timing of interest rate cut by Bank of Korea. Right, which is why this, you said this was a very difficult question. Professor Buchak, meanwhile, moving forward, is the global economy beyond the risk of a recession now? Uh, no, you know, recessions can always happen. They're very, very hard to predict. Um, usually they happen because of something unexpected. Uh, some big shock will happen and, and it'll be bad for the global economy. Um, hard to predict what that will be. I think things that I'm thinking about, uh, China is a big question mark. There are these near-term issues that, that we talked about, like issues in the real estate sector, what's going on in the labor market, debt accumulation, and kind of more broadly, there's this question of how successfully and, and how uh, uh, China will handle its transition to being a higher income economy. Um, that said, you know, I would be more worried about China's economy as a Korean person than I would be as an American because of the sort of closer economic ties, especially as an export partner. Um, you know, beyond that, I think we're going to see sort of a, a continuing pattern of increased trade barriers going up globally, uh, especially between China and the rest of the world. Partly this is about geopolitical tensions. I think partly it's just sort of old fashioned protectionism. Um, there, there, you probably uh, will see some protectionism from Europe around their auto industry. Uh, the U.S. has high import tariffs actually on Chinese EVs, and I would expect uh, to see some of those coming out of Europe soon too, especially that their, their auto industry is facing a lot of pressure from China. Um, as for the U.S., you know, there's nothing acute that I'm worried about. Um, the, the commercial real estate sector is not doing great. Uh, but it's just not a huge part of the U.S. economy. It's something like 5% of GDP. Uh, banks have a lot of commercial real estate exposure, but this sort of issue with commercial real estate has been on the radar for a long time, and hopefully it won't catch the financial system by surprise. Um, so, you know, something will happen. I just don't think we know what it is yet. I suppose time will tell us then. All right, Professor Buczek, as always, thank you very much for your insights. And Professor Kim, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Glad right. That is all the time we have for Thursday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow.